Okay, uh, before starting the next talk, just an announcement. Uh, here are um, certificates of uh, participation for the ones who need it. Uh, on uh, the right side, uh, the usual standard uh, uh, quote, on the other side, the reduced one, okay, for the PhD students, okay, so they are different places. Okay. I think we can start with uh, the second talk of uh, today afternoon. The next speaker is Francesco Danino, uh, who will talk about graded doctrines and quantitative equality. Please. Okay. So thanks uh, for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity of presenting this work here today. So this talk is based on a joint work with Fabio Pasquali, and it is about the categorical analysis of logics for quantitative reasoning. And so let me start by briefly sketching what I have in mind when I talk about quantitative reasoning. So uh, <clears throat> to summarize the quantitative approach by a slogan, so we could say that in, in a quantitative approach, we want to measure how much a property holds, rather than just saying whether it holds or not. And this can be done in several ways. So for instance, we could use non-negative real numbers measuring how far an element is from satisfying a property, or we could use numbers between zero and one measuring the probability that an element satisfies a given property. And a common feature of all these settings is that we, we have to compose this quantity by means of some kind of uh, symmetric monoidal uh, operation. And another, uh, important feature of, of continuous reasoning is that uh, equivalence relations are, are naturally generalized to distances, which measures the, the similarity between elements rather than just stating their equivalence. Okay, so the goal uh, we would like to pursue is to describe the categorical structure of logics for continuous reasoning in, in such a way that equality predicates can be interpreted by distances and in such a way that um, standard results, so we can generalize standard results about usual non-quantitative equality. So to do so, we work in the framework of doctrine, which is a categorical structure for logic introduced by Lovier some decades ago. So let me recall the definition. So a doctrine is just a contravariant factor from a category with finite products to the category of both sets. And some names. So the category C is the base category of the doctrine. So the pole set associated with an object X is called the fiber of X. And the action of the doctrine on an arrow F is called the reindexing along F. So intuitively, a doctrine models uh, a logic where uh, types of the language are the objects of the base category, terms are the arrows in the base category, and it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. You have not like. Great. Wait a moment, please. <laughs> so where I am, sorry. <laughs> okay. Doctrine, the definition here. Sorry. That's the definition. Okay, and, and the comments on the on the bottom. Yeah. Okay. So so we're, uh, so the, the intuition so for, for a doctrine is that a doctrine models the logic, as I was saying. So where uh, the object and the arrows of the base category models types and terms, and the both sets associated with a type models the properties of that type ordered by logical entailment. Uh, okay, so the, does it work? Yeah, no, okay, <laughs> sorry. So the, the paradigmatic example is the, is the doctrine of H-valued predicates, uh, which is a doctrine over the category of set. So we fix a pose at H, and then we define a doctrine mapping uh, set A, to the set of function of h valid function with the pointwise order, and uh, we map a function to the precomposition monotone function, and that's uh, a doctrine. 
And then we have many other examples, uh, syntactic example, realizability examples, and, and many others I do not have time to discuss. And um, okay, so <clears throat> to deal with quantitative reasoning, we, we need to work in some minimal fragment of linear logic. And so we introduced this notion of primary linear doctrine, which just modeled the tensor one fragment of linear logic. So uh, primary linear doctrine is just uh, a doctrine where each fiber is a com an ordered commutative monoid and where reindexing are monotone monoid homomorphism. Uh, <clears throat> so some examples. So if we take uh, a an order, as if H is an ordered commutative monoid, then the doctrine of H valued predicates is primarily linear with the pointwise structure. Then, if you build the syntactic doctrine over a theory in the tensor one fragment of linear logic, you get the primary linear doctrine. And then you have realizability doctrine over linear combinatory algebras and other examples you can imagine. <clears throat> okay, so this that's the minimal logic we work with. And then we have to introduce equality because, as I said, we want to deal with uh, quantitative reasoning with equality. And the first attempt we can try to follow is the standard one again introduced by Lovia, which characterizes equality by means of left adjoints. So we can we could define an elementary primary linear doctrine as a primary linear doctrine where the reindexing along diagonals has a left adjoint satisfying a couple of conditions. And this is equivalent, uh, is equivalently uh, characterized in, in that way. So we could say that a primary linear doctrine is elementary if for any object A, there is a, a, an element in the fiber over A ten, times A, so a binary predicate, which models equality, which satisfies these two inequalities. So to read this inequality, what is important to know is that the, the order relation models logical entailment and projections play the role of variables. So the first inequality states the reflexivity of the, of the element delta A, because you use the diagonal, which is, so we use twice the same variable. And the second uh, inequality says a substitutivity property, because as you can see, we replace in alpha by two by pi three. And these two uh, elements, uh, these two characterizations are equivalent by means of this identification. So it is important to know the, the important one is the first one. So if we have left adjoints, we can define the equality by applying the left adjoint to the U, to the identity of the, of the monoid. Okay, so what's nice is that we can prove that in an elementary primary linear doctrine, the element delta A is always a distance in the sense that these three properties holds which are reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And <clears throat> to see this on an example, let's consider uh, this doctrine. So the doctrine of predicates valued in non-negative real numbers. So in this setting, uh, delta A would be a function from A times A to non-negative real numbers. And uh, it will have to satisfy these three properties, which are the reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. And note that the transitivity property becomes the usual triangular inequality. So it is a distance in the, in the usual sense. So that's nice because we have an equality which can be interpreted as a distance. But of course, we, we have an issue at this point. And <clears throat> the problem is that delta A is not only a distance, but it also has to satisfy these two properties. So it is also affine and replicable. And <clears throat> this is uh, due to the fact it is defined in terms of left adjoint. So any element defined applying a left adjoint to the identity of the monoid uh, is necessarily affine and replicable. So this is weird in a linear setting because the key point of linear logic is to control the use of formulas. And these two uh, properties basically said we cannot control the use of equality because it can be freely replicated. But it is even worse if we look at it from the point of view of quantitative reasoning because it makes delta A, delta A uh, an equivalence relation. So we, we, we cannot interpret it by an arbitrary distances. Let's see why. So again, considering the, exa the, the example of non-negative real numbers, a finance means this inequality, which is not a big problem. But replicability means we have this inequality, which can be satisfied only if delta A is either zero or infinity. So basically it is an equivalence relation. So <clears throat> this shows that the standard approach by left adjoint cannot support a quantitative interpretation of equality. And so we need something else. 
uh, the, the, the idea, so, so the problem is the substitutivity uh, rule, which is too strong. So if we look at it syntactically, so it, it allows us to replace X by Y, but it does not take into account intuitively the resources needed to perform the substitution. So intuitively, we have one equality predicate, which is delta A, which should be substituted for any formula alpha, while the cost of performing the substitution may be different for different alpha, because intuitively it, it should depend on the number of occurrences of the variable X in the formula. And this is not considered in, in this rule. So the, the idea and we, we propose it is to change a little bit the setting, so to work in a setting where we can explicitly model resources. And in this way, we could be able to rephrase the substitutivity rule in such a way to take into account this cost of the, of the substitution. So this enriched, uh, enlarged setting is based on graded modalities. So graded modalities are a refinement of the usual bank modality of linear, log linear logic. So instead of having just one modality, we, we have a family of modality indexed by elements of the same ring, which model resources. And intuitively, bank R alpha means that we have R copies of alpha, whatever it means. In, <laughs> it depends on the, choice, on the choice of the same ring. And what's nice is that these modalities have a nice categorical semantics in terms of uh, graded linear exponential components. So the first step is to introduce graded modalities on primary linear doctrines. And to do so, we just have to rephrase the axioms of graded linear exponential components in this fibered setting. So a graded modality on the primary linear doctrines is just a family of natural transformations indexed by resources or the same ring. So the naturality means that every uh, the, this uh, modality is monotone on every fiber and commute with your indexing. And then it has to satisfy a bunch of axioms. Of axioms. So the first two said that uh, the modality is lax monoidal on each fiber. The, these two uh, admit uh, co weakening and contraction rules in, in a control way. So we use the additive structure of the same ring to control weakening and contraction. And uh, so the, if you, in other terms, the affineness and the replicability of formulas, basically. Then we have a couple of uh, axioms for the, which are a graded version of commonad axiom, uh, axioms using the multiplicative structure of the same ring. Finally, we have a contravariance axiom, um, which basically said that we can always decrease the amount of resources we have according to the order of the same ring. And then a graded doctrine is just the primary linear doctrine together with a graded modality. So some examples, so if we, again, if we work in with the doctrine uh, of predicates valued in non-negative real numbers, we can define the amplification modality uh, on the same, using the same ring of non-negative real numbers, which is defined by scalar multiplication, basically. Then if we use the singleton same ring, we get back the usual bank modality of the linear logic. Then using the same ring of natural numbers ordered by equality, we get the exact uses modality of bounded linear logic because using uh, contraction and co-unit, we, we get that Bn of alpha provides exactly n copies of alpha. And then we have many other examples. OK, let's come to the key definition, uh, which is the notion of Lipschitz doctrine, uh, which is basically a graded doctrine with the quantitative notion of equality. So a Lipschitz doctrine is just a graded doctrine where for each element A, we have a binary predicate. As, as before, which is required to be a distance. So we have the, the usual three axioms. And then we have the graded substitutive rule, which says that for every alpha, there exists an, an element of the same ring R for which hold the substitutivity property holds. So note that the equality predicates occurs under the modality with the correct uh, resource. In this way, we cannot we can perform the substitution only if we have the correct amount of resources intuitively. And then we have a bunch of axioms for compatibility with products, which are not that relevant. The important thing to notice is that they are equivalent to these two. And so in, in our setting, uh, equality is still affine, but as we saw, the big problem is with replicability and with the uh, affineness. <clears throat> okay, so uh, why Lipschitz? 
uh, the name Lipschitz uh, is due to this proposition. Basically, in, in a Lipschitz doctrine, every arrow in the base category is a Lipschitz map because this entailment is, is the rival. If you, if you look at if you look at it, it's, it really resembles the, the Lipschitz condition. Basically, to derive the equality between f of x and f of y, we have to scale the equality between x and y by a factor f, which depends on f. OK, to produce examples uh, of Lipschitz doctrine, we, we describe a, a general construction, which starts from graded doctrines and produces Lipschitz 1. So the construction goes as follows. So, uh, the, 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 the doctrine we obtain as, as objects, pairs of an object in the base category of the original doctrines and an affine distance in the original doctrine. And then an arrow is a Lipschitz map. So it is an arrow from A rho to B sigma is an arrow from A to B in the original category, which satisfies the Lipschitz condition for some F. And then the, the elements on the fibers are just, uh, is a suborder of the, of the fiber over A which is uh, on, on those elements which are substitutive for the, for the distance of the, of, the, of the new object, so for rho in this case. And this doctrine inherits the graded structure from the original one, and moreover, it is Lipschitz by taking as equality exactly the metric row uh, we have uh, considered. Okay, so if we apply this construction to the doctrine of, of predicates valued in non-negative real numbers, what we get, with the amplification modality, so with the scalar multiplication, what we get is this doctrine where, where the base category is exactly the category of metric spaces with the Lipschitz maps, and where the elements on the fibers have are functions from A to zero infinity, which has to satisfy this inequality, which basically requires that also uh, elements on the fibers are Lipschitz maps in a sense, in a formal sense, since they are actually Lipschitz maps. Uh, okay, so to compare to, to compare this, uh, so to formally state the relationship between graded doctrines and Lipschitz doctrines, uh, we can phrase, uh, we can organize them into two categories. So on the left, we have the two categories of graded doctrines, and on the right, we have the two categories of uh, Lipschitz doctrines. Then, of course, there is a forgetful two functor, which just forgets the distances. Uh, and then the construction I showed a minute ago extends to a two functor in the other direction, so that which goes from graded doctrines to Lipschitz one, uh, and this two functor turns out to be a right two adjoint to the forgetful. And moreover, uh, this two adjunction is two commonadic, meaning that the the, uh, the Lipschitz doctrines are coalgebras for the two commonad induced by these two adjunctions. This is relevant because in the usual no quantitative setting, uh, we have the same feature. So PD is the category of primary doctrines, which are doctrines with the usual uh, conjunction. So where fibers are in semilattices, ED is the category of element, uh, two category of elementary doctrines, which are primary doctrines with the usual notion of equality by means of left adjuncts. And it, is, it has been proved that elementary doctrines are co-algebras for the two commonad induced by that adjunction. And so this co-algebraic nature of equality is shared between the quantitative and the non-quantitative notion of equality. And moreover, we have inclusions from primary doctrines and elementary doctrines to the corresponding two categories, which basically attach the identity graded modality to a primary doctrine to an elementary doctrine, making them Lipschitz and, no, sorry, greater than Lipschitz respectively. So to conclude, we have other results I do not have time to to present. So we have studied syntactic aspects. So we have a calculus and some computer results, and we have extended these results to uh, larger fragments of linear logic up to full linear logic with quantifiers. And concerning future direction, we have many directions here, at least just some of them. Uh, if you are interested, we I'm happy to discuss them. And so here are some references if you're interested. And so that's it. And thank you for the attention. I hope everything worked. <laughs> Perfectly. <laughs> Perfectly. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Francesco, for your nice talk. Um, any question? Comment? Over there.
thanks for the talk. Uh, I want to ask if this could be also applied to probability logic. So maybe by using some kind of augmentation of the hyper doctrine valued in the whole set of events of a probability space and using the probability measure to get the grading in somehow in some way. Um, I have to think of it. So it depends. I don't know what do you mean by probability logic. So it, if you mean something like the something like the H valued predicates where H is the pole set of uh, is the quantile of uh, probabilities, of course, yes, but I, I don't know if that's the point. Yeah, well, there's uh, logics or at least attempts to uh, do logic in which you also assign a probability value to proposition. So, it, of course, you don't get the whole uh, properties of something which is valued in the heighting algebra, but uh, it would be interesting to compare the two situations. Yeah, it, it's it would be interesting. I I don't have an answer at the moment, but I will look at it for sure. Thank it's you. Interesting. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thank you very much for a very nice talk. Yes. Thank you. I improved from the previous version. I heard. So um, I would like to ask, consider the, the Lipschitz categories, which is a kind of completion with the uh, equivalence relation from uh, the linear um, doctrine, and uh, which um, analogous of, uh, the, the relation with uh, the elementary doctrines, the primary doctrines. Uh, did you consider the what happens uh, if you um, uh, consider the extensional collapse, uh, so-called, uh, at the level of um, your linear uh, doctrines? So if you take a doctrine uh, and it is um, an elementary, you can always put uh, uh, the extensional collapse on the base category so that you have a so-called of uh, comprehension, uh, comprehensive diagonal. So, so it, did you, you have to question the, the arrows by an equivalence relation. So, yes. So did you consider the meaning of this uh, in your setting? Uh, not yet. It would be interesting to look at it. Uh, the, the point is that here, it's quite difficult to imagine which is the correct uh, equivalence you should use to quotient uh, arrows. Because in the, in the nonlinear setting, you, you just work with equivalence relations. And so it's basically you have one reasonable possibility to quotient out arrows. Uh, in this setting, since you have distances, I don't, uh, I'm not really sure which is the correct way of quotienting out uh, arrows, but it, for sure it would be an interesting direction to, to, to investigate. Thank you very much. Thank, uh, thank you, Mili. Any other question? Over there. Thanks for the talk. Thank uh, you. So uh, when you were uh, speaking about the, the, uh, the commonality of the forgetful two functor, uh, there is, uh, so you had the downstairs, the elementary and primary doctrines and upstairs their uh, yeah. linear versions. And the, the adjunction downstairs, uh, uh, so gives rise to the commonads uh, and you can look at the elementary uh, doctrines as the algebras. And the same adjunction then gives rise to a monad on, on this category of elementary doctrines. And uh, the pseudo uh, algebras for this monad, uh, for these two monads, uh, are the elementary doctrines with quotients. Yeah. Is there something analogous in the setting, in the linear setting as well? Uh, so of course, we have a two monad on the category of quadra because yeah. you just have but to compose the function in the other direction. You don't know what the quotient can be in that. And I think that the notion of quotient can be uh, defined uh, in a similar way. So we, we, you should pay attention to, to grades, I think. Uh, but I think we can, we can define a notion of quotient. And the, 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 the Lipschitz completion of a graded doctrine would have this, so would be in a sense the free, uh, sorry, would have quotients in this sense. But, I'm not sure what 
what algebra and also I'm not sure uh, I don't know uh, genuine examples of, of this structure so I, we shouldn't should look at examples to, to understand what this formal definition means in, in the linear setting. Yeah. I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, yes. I'm Thanks. not sure if there is a, I mean, I'm, uh, I don't know very much about linear logic, but maybe there is a, a notion of quotient for a, a linear equivalence relation. Yeah, I, I also don't know. <laughs> no, also about equality in linear logic is not that much studied. So uh, at least as far as I know, I know a couple of papers about that, so. That's it, thank you. Thank you. So if no other question, let's thank Francesco again. Thank you. And we have five minutes break.